Good afternoon, good afternoon kids, welcome on board this Thursday afternoon's Sunset Safari Kids Drive, coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve, hello. My name is Steve, I'm joined by Panda all the way over there in the back of this new vehicle that you might not have seen yet, but it is a sportingly long, beautiful Land Cruiser that Panda's got so much space in the back of the vehicle now that he could probably have this entire herd of Impala and their friends over for the afternoon drive. Well, I think it'd be quite difficult to get them in the back of the vehicle. First of all, because they're wild animals. And second of all, well, they don't like to take lifts from strangers, which is a very good point. Don't ever take lift from strangers, boys and girls. Now, this afternoon, we would love to hear your questions and your comments. Please do send them through. Ask your parents to send them through to us on the YouTube chat stream or if they are on the conversation on Twitch, not Twitch, Twitter, Twitter, or what do they call it these days, X, I can't even keep up, let us know. So right now we've got a beautiful and often overlooked Impala. It's a very exciting time of year for Impalas. Their population is going to grow soon, but how does a population grow? Well, they need to go through a bit of a breeding season to do so. And that was the boy that you saw a moment ago. And around here, a lot of them are moving into the shade. It's quite warm. There are lots and lots of females. So within the next few weeks, impala behavior is going to go absolutely crazy. I'm so surprised we haven't heard a lot of noises. Panda, have you been hearing it at night? I don't know what's going on. I think there's been a little bit more rain. It's sort of pushing the craziness of what we call the impala rutting season a little bit late. I'm not sure. I can't, can't be certain. But we will be hearing crazy noises that are quite frightening. The first time you hear a male impala giving his, his gurgling roar, it's very difficult to understand until you hear it for the first time but apparently that gurgling roar that he gives actually is what stimulates the females into their ovulation allowing them to become reproductive so it's a very interesting process you could kind of say it's his love song they are all of the, lo the lovely ladies so between first full moon in May and the second full moon in May that obviously can move a little bit that is generally the rutting season for Impala here in the Kruger National Park Mickey 10 years old well as you can see all of these in front of us here are female and they don't have horns you might see a couple of young males in there with these little pin like horns on top of their head they were born in November but uh, male impalas have horns, female impala do not. And there's a reason for that. I wonder if you kids at home know why some antelope have horns and some don't. All antelope in South Africa, as far as I can think off the top of my head, all of the males have horns. But not all of the females. It's very interesting, very interesting. And there's a reason for that there's a reason for that and uh, the reason being that the females don't use them for fighting okay but then why do some female impala not impala why do some female antelope have horns hmm well a lot of it also boils down to their habitat and where they occur so impala Kudu, Nyala, Bushbuck, to name a few. We would call them woodland species. So they like to live in areas with either dense to medium dense vegetation. The impala obviously move from the dense to the open area. So being in an area where you've got these things on top of your head and you're not using them for fighting, well, they're actually not useful at all. So female antelope like that don't have them because they don't need them. So it is a nice warm afternoon here in Juma. We'll continue on our antelope discussion. But let's go see what the weatherman has to say.
Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here live at Amakala Private Game Reserve in the very southern parts of the Eastern Cape, where we are watching some monkeys who are alarm calling. I'm not too sure exactly what it is that they've seen. I haven't, he I haven't heard a specific call that would suggest that there's a predator in the area, but the call that a big male is making at the moment is uh, is an alert call, alarm call. So obviously he's paying more attention. And anyway, hello everybody. My name is Eric, joined by Morgan behind the camera. And this afternoon we are going to be your eyes and ears on a lovely, slightly windy afternoon here at Amakala. Now it's definitely a call to alarm everybody in the area, all monkeys especially, that uh, you need to be careful now. It's possible they may have smelt something. Uh, the wind is swirling a little bit. And uh, well, we're not exactly too sure what it is. Could be a lion, it could be maybe the three amigos. I'm not exactly too sure, but we will investigate and we'll try and have a look around in the area, see what it is that we can find that's making these monkeys uneasy. The other thing that's going to help us a lot is there are a lot of warthogs in, around in the area and um, the warthogs are obviously, they're going to help us as well because they will run away if they see something. Luca, it is very cool and I, we know it is an alarm call because the monkeys are all at the very, very top of the tree, the whole troop, no, not so much, they've all kind of spread out, um, but uh, yeah, like I said, they're all at the top of the tree and uh, they, they, one was barking and uh, he was looking in a specific direction and barking specifically in that direction he wasn't barking anywhere else or looking anywhere else while he was doing the the barking he was looking down the valley in the direction of the dune thicket or not the dune thicket in the direction of quite a fair bit of thicket um so um, yeah we sort of we know it's an alarm call also it's a call that i've heard before when there's been some form of danger it could have even been like something as small as a caracal that could have set them off or uh, no it's definitely a a non-human threat that the monkeys were barking at In two magical African wilderness areas, the Masai Mara in Kenya and the Great Kugu National Park in South Africa, five expert safari guides follow a cast of compelling animal characters and the never-ending stories that define their lives. The CAT report documents real stories of real predators, as witnessed and captured by a band of obsessive wildlife filmmakers. <laughs>
and it will pass around this little newborn. And uh, this is how basically the bonding starts. It all starts like this. The grooming is a very, very, very basic sort of bonding type of method. Um, everybody grooms everybody. You know, it's not just mom will groom her, her babies, her son. Uh, mom will groom anybody, you know. Babies can groom anybody. Babies can groom big males. Big males can groom little babies, other females, you know, other males. They will groom everybody and it's basically kind of like a hug in a sense. It's like a, a hug and a kind of a chat almost in a sense. I find it very, very cool. The social structure of, of uh, monkeys is very, very strong. You know, they try, they try not leave leave anyone behind. Oh, there's lots of movement in the tree at the top there. Welcome back with us, everybody, and what we've got a impala having a poo. Perfectly timed. Great time to rejoin us here, and there's a young impala. He's two, maybe three, probably only two. You see the horns are just going onto that first sort of bend. And uh, so this time of year, because we have the breeding season coming up for the impala, all the male impala are chased away. They're kept away, but they still want to hang out in groups. So they hang out with other males, and quite often you find groups of males of the same age. And there are three of them here. I just saw a very cool bird there a second ago. Three of them, and they're going to obviously hang off on the edge, and they're going to feed, and they're going to stay in a group. They're going to get build up condition, they're going to play fight, and then in these ones, two, three, four years' time, they will be competing for the top rank of the dominant male impala. But right now, they've just got to stay alive. Ooh. Got some leopard-faced vultures there, Panda. Hello, Ezra, seven years old. And in Pal in Afrikaans, is called a rooibok. A rooibok. They are very cool in Palas. I like them a lot. Now, I'm going to see if we can get these vultures on camera because one of them, at least, is a leopard-faced vulture. There might even be two that are leopard-faced vultures. And they are one of the big six birds that we find in the Kruger. Let's see if we can get them. Yes. Both of them look like leopard-faced vultures. And can you see that they're going around? Oh, sorry, Panda, my foot was on the brake. You see how they're going around in circles? A little bit of a flap there. But vultures are very heavy birds. They have very big wings, very broad wings to pick up on the thermals, the heat that's being generated off of the ground. And that goes up in a spiral, in a vortex. And they are catching that to get elevation and to get distance up in the sky so they can fly off and find some food. And the leopard face vulture is the largest vulture that we find here. they're under the big six is because they are large birds they breed slowly and their population is not very big but it's becoming a little bit difficult to see them now Camilla that's a very good question and the answer is yes 
Now, the reason why they have very similar wings, obviously different vultures are different sizes, but they have a similar design. Their body is quite big and quite heavy, and they want to have really big wings with little fingers on the end so that they can catch the thermals to pick themselves up. So it doesn't require much energy to fly. They use very little energy to fly. Um, when if you're a heavy bird, it's going to cost you a lot of energy to fly, so they use the thermals. But when there's no thermals and there's no heat, vultures can spend days sitting in one tree waiting for the weather to improve. So it does have its challenges. But there have been some lions around and there have been some kills around. And so I think the vultures have been feeding, but we don't know exactly where this kill was. James was here yesterday with a found a lioness who was very full and then found her again with pieces of a buffalo, but we still don't know where it is. Okay, well it's getting a little bit too far away. I can't even see them anymore. My naked eye. Thanks, Panda. Very nice to see. There were a few more that went off in the other direction, but you can see how they sort of move because those, those thermals generating from the ground are moving. They don't stay in one place. Okay, well Cedric is out and about and he's on his vehicle ready for game drive. Let's go check in with him and see what his plans are. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Nice to have a leopard face vulture. I haven't seen one of those uh, vultures for whew, uh, for months and months and months. But yes, anyway, good afternoon to all the kids. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on Wendy, we've got Muscles and Paul. So yes, thank you so much for joining us on this amazing sunset safari this afternoon. All right, so what I'm doing here, as you can see, we've got a huge midden. So this is called a midden. So this is made by a rhino, a white rhino. So what a white rhino does, especially the male. So the male is territorial. Territorial means that they've got a set area that they kind of have like that's their boundary and they stay in that area. And then they'll have these middens all over inside of their territory. And what they do all the time, when they go from one midden to the next midden to the next midden, they go and mark their territory by creating this big pile of dung. So what, this is not just once, this is over and over and over and over again. So what the male white rhino does, he'll come to this midden and he'll see, okay, it's time to kind of, uh, you know, mark my territory here. So he'll actually then deposit some of his dung into this midden and then he'll kick it around with his back feet as well as he'll then spray urine all over here and then he'll kick it around, kick it around and eventually you get all this broken up dung that you can see around here and then you can see bigger it is the more impressive it is for a female. So if a female is in heat, if a female is looking for a male, a female will come past here but she will do her droppings next to the midden and then she will not kick it around, she'll keep it intact. So when that male, when the territorial male makes his turn again to all these middens he says, hey but there's a female rhino that's in heat that wants to pretty much mate with him then of course he'll pick up on her scent and then he'll try and follow up on that uh, female but why i say a second of all why do i say it's a white rhino so if you look here carefully look in the dung it's got all the grass so that's the main thing that the white rhino eats it's just just grass so it's a grazer so you can see it's just grass inside of here there's no leaves there's no branches it's just grass so they are grazers if it was a black rhino black rhinos the, the dung itself has also got a different coloration to the white rhino as well as in the black rhino's dung you'll find because they are browsers you'll find a lot of little leaf litter inside of it little branches leaf litter and then if, you'll know that that is a black rhino uh willow i've seen animals like <clears throat> jackal and jackal will mark their territory as well by actually 
putting their scat inside of the, the rhino's dung like this. I've seen many times, you go look at rhino's, uh, rhino dung or rhino middens, you'll find actually a little bit of scat inside there. And have you seen it like that in the we or eastern side of the Sabi Sands, where I was working on that side, and we actually saw those, all the middens had actually jackal scat inside of it. So, well, I don't know why they they used it, but they enjoyed using the rhino, rhino midden as uh, their little kind of marking areas as well. So yes, very nice to see this. But anyway, talking about rhinos, talking about rhino middens, and talking about this magnificent animal, let's head over to Amakala as Eric has got one. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. heavily what yes it when they get to the 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 breeding age let's let's call it that when they get to age to the age where they are going to start mating generally speaking the males will be bigger than the females but it's not impossible for a female to be bigger than a male not impossible at all it's just not very common most of the time the males are much bigger but with good genes you can get a rather large female and a fairly fairly smallish bull maybe it doesn't have as as uh, good genes that, as the female does you can see also that part of his face you know from above his horns all the way to just kind of below that hump on his neck you see that that's part of the skin that has not been uh, touched by mud you can see only the side of him he can't really i mean he can roll over and he can get it on his back but getting it on his face there in between his horns and his ears is generally a, a tricky task it's not something is that very, very very easy but um no it doesn't look like he's been rolling in the mud recently Ezekiel, the ooh, 
What is he using? He's using his ears to listen to us. Their ears are bigger and longer than hippo ears. I find hippo ears cuter. Hippo ears are so small, so round, and if you notice when they lift their heads out of the water, the first thing that you see move are their ears. They do a little, give them a little bit of a flick, obviously flicking any water that's inside of their ears out so that they can hear properly. But rhino ears are definitely bigger. But in some cases, hippos can have bigger faces Bigger mouths, much, much, much bigger mouths. Rhino's mouth is generally about 20 centimeters wide. Oh, that would be the white rhino, of course. The, the black rhino doesn't have such a wide mouth. They have more of a, a lip, uh, a, a very triangular, downward triangular facing lip. That's why another name for them is the hooked lipped rhino whereas this one is the square mouthed rhino or the flat mouth because look how wide it is Lila, no, not really. On their tails, they'll have fur. Um, in different parts of their bodies, on the edges of their ears, they'll have little tufts, little tiny, little fluffy bits. But for the large majority, their bodies don't have lots of fur. But they have very, very thick skin and uh, a decent layer of fat to help keep them warm at night time and in the winter. He's obviously, he can hear me talking, but because the wind is coming from his direction, it's a little bit difficult to actually pinpoint. Well, I'm pretty sure he's actually pinpointed where we are, but you know, he can definitely hear. And you can see he doesn't really want to continue going forward on the path that he is on, because that will lead it straight, lead him straight to us. Oh, he's beautiful. Not exactly what's going on, not exactly sure what's going on with the weather, but we've just, we started off the drive nice and sunny and open, clear skies, and now it's starting, it looks like there's a big cloud of mist coming in. And we will see this a little bit later. Majority of the time when rhinos are awake, they are feeding with their faces on the ground. Waylon, not until they die. Until the rhino is no longer, his horn will continue to grow, both of them. And uh, you'll find that the, they actually have to file them down like um what do we call like your fingernails okay he's obviously heard something else and he's not happy but um yeah so it grows out from the base of the horn you see where the where its thickest part is that can get very kind of fuzzy um and then obviously the horn does keep growing upwards making it very very long so they file them down they sharpen them and they also just try and keep good care on them. Very important to look after your horn. Very important indeed. You can just see his big nostrils over there. Last time I saw this boy was quite some time ago. He's definitely been doing some hiding. 
definitely some hiding. We're going to send you over to Cedric, who is on the move, to check in what he's up to. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, I'm now, as I said, I'm going to try and come and take a look at uh, this dam. Yeah, it's called Biffleshook Dam. It's a dam that's right on the northeastern corner of uh, Juma. And I'm um, coming here just to first sit a little bit at the dam, just to scan this area. There's a big crocodile that uh, resides in this water as well. So maybe we're lucky finding this crocodile. Or there's also a leopard that's been hanging around here, Marips. And I want to see if... Uh, Maybe he might be around for us this afternoon. But I'm going to first just going to sit here. There's a lovely hippopotamus house in here. Let's just stop here. There we go. Always nice to do some of the water holes, especially on nice hot days like this. Oh, there's a little oxpecker that's coming to land on his head. Look at that. Oh, they didn't want to be, they didn't want to go underwater, so I guess they decided to take off. Many times those birds that you just saw taking off there now, the oxpeckers, they'll use the hippo's head as like a little base, like a, a structure so that they can sit on there and then they can also have a little bit of a drink for the afternoon. But yep, they, well clearly the hippo didn't want them there. But it's always nice just to come to these water holes on hot days, They're always important. You get the hippos, you get some nice bird life, some maybe impalas or kudu. Oh, all different kinds of animals coming down for a drink. And sometimes it looks like it's very quiet now, but it can change up very quickly in an instant. But yeah, this is a nice hippo. It looks like a female. You know why I'm saying a female? And it's just by the pinkness around the eye. Sebastian, eight years old. Good afternoon. The dams, they get their names through the owners of the da of the properties. You know, maybe something happened in this area during the time and then they realized, okay, well, that's a nice name for a dam. And then they give that dam that name. So it's all different ways. It's not just a white way. It's all different ways. I like this, this dam, Biffle's Hook. Uh, maybe because it's very close to Biffle's Hook property to the north. You never know. I'm not too sure exactly how this one got its name. But you can see this hippo fast asleep. Now and again, opening the eyes, just checking if we're still here. And you'll find uh, a very dense bone, so it's not floating. That hippo must probably be standing at a very shallow spot here in the dam. And it'll just fold it. If it wants to go under, it'll just fold its legs and it'll just sink to the bottom. And then when it needs to come up again, they'll kick themselves up again. That's how they move. And they cannot swim. So the way they move, they go to bot they go to the bottom of the uh, of the dam, onto the ground, and then they do like a moonwalk, like they, you know, do this moonwalking on the on the uh, bottom, and then they kick themselves up again, coming to the surface, and then they go down again, and they moonwalk again, kick themselves up again, so they just go with momentum. So that's how they move. Now, why this female's all by herself, I'm not too sure. I wonder, have you seen redders again, Mpo? No, so redders is a young uh, a hippo calf. A young hi uh, hippo calf that has uh, been hanging around Gary Dam and this dam. And there's also other dams a little bit further north of us uh, in Bifflesook itself. So maybe they might have gone that side. So you never know. All right, well, we're going to still sit around here at the dam and see what else comes down here. Let's head over to old Steve-O's to see what's happening at his dam. Thanks, Setters. Well, water points are definitely the place to check this afternoon. And when we do check watering holes, there's a very good chance you're going to find a stork. And here we have a splendid saddle-built stork. Over here at the yellow eye, can you see the eye is yellow? It might not be very easy to see, but it's got a yellow eye, and that makes this the female. The male does not have a yellow eye, and he's got a little yellow little bit that hangs down on his chin. It's quite easy to identify. Isn't she beautiful? 
another one of our big six birds everybody so we had the leopard faced vulture and now we've got the saddle build stork and they call it a saddle build because you can see that it's got the bill and then on the front there almost looks like there's a little horse riding saddle on the front and she's actually down on her what we'd call her knees just resting nice long legs enables them to walk out into the water and fish and frog but right now she's just spending a moment in rest it's interesting how she chooses to do so in the middle of this sunny patch because it is a relatively warm afternoon Here we are at one of our other watering holes on Juma. This is probably one of the most difficult genus names to say for a bird. Epipiprophorhynchus. See, I can't even say it. Epipip. Oh, I'm not even going to try again. No, <laughs> I'm going to show you, Pan. Underneath the word saddle build there, you'll see with that. Ep, ep, I'm not even going to try. Whoever came up with that genus name was really having a, a laugh with themselves in real life. Eh? <laughs> e, Epipiorhynchus. Sure, that was a whole lot going on there. Violet, do you want to know why their beaks are so red? It is a mystery sometimes in the animal kingdom uh, why birds have certain colors uh, but when they're younger they don't have the colors so it's almost an advertisement of being an adult. Like the Impala Ram, he gets his big horns, he's showing that he's fully mature. Um, many other animals, the lion gets a big mane, a leopard gets a big thick dewlap. Birds tend to go for color. Uh, we know that birds can see color. Uh, a lot of other animals that we see don't see color. We know birds, monkeys, baboons, humans can all see color. Um, but most of the other animals that we, we look at don't see color. So for them, they've completely let go of the need to have color. They all see black and white. But birds, it's all about appearance. And well, there's no better way to stand out from the crowd than coloration. And the female, obviously, she doesn't have that little wattle, but she's got a, a, a yellow eye, and the male has got the wattle. So when they're fully mature, they can identify each other. But the juveniles are just little scraggly, gray beaked storks. If you found them on their own, it would be difficult to tell exactly which species they were. So a lot of birds go through what we call juvenile plumage. And then it takes a few years, depending on the species, some of them it's only a season, to come into adult breeding plumage. And obviously, to become an adult means you've survived, you've managed to learn how to navigate the world, you've learned how to provide food, and then you would be a good provider or a good parent. So it differentiates, for the most part, the babies or the young juveniles from the adults. In a nutshell, Epipiorhynchus. Sure, that's the surname of this bird. I don't know what it means, but it's got me stumped. It's got me stumped. Scientific names are very interesting when you know what they mean, but when you don't know what they mean, they can boggle the mind. on safari.
Hey, well, you're still with us, everybody. Uh, we're going to head on down to our southern boundary and head on over towards the east, towards a place called Chitwa. I think. All right, guys, we've got uh, Marips, as you can see. We've got a young male leopard, and we just came to try and follow up on him. And you can see he's got that terrible scar on the, oof, a terrible scar on the side, and that was due to a snare. That's a piece of wire that was removed around his, his side. But he's looking all right. He's climbing in the tree, as you can see. He's climbing a tree, so it's always a good thing. So he's going to climb the tree. He's just showing that he's got the ability to do that. Mm. Uh, it's still very raw. That is still a very, very fresh, oh, fresh wound. Oh. <laughs> but he's getting there. You can see he's still walking very gingerly along here. I think he might just go and settle down and lie up on one of the branches. Oh, yeah. But now, what's happened here, yeah, because he had a snare, it was about a week ago, the snare was removed by the Sabi sand, by the vets. They removed that wire around his body and uh, then they treated it as well. So they gave him antibiotics and they treated him just to kind of, you know, get the wound to heal up much quicker. And uh, apparently they are, they are going to come out here again tomorrow morning and to treat that wound. So what they're gonna do, they're just gonna tranquilize him, just to put him to sleep for a bit, and then they're gonna just kind of clean the wound, making sure that it is still good, and uh, that will be done tomorrow morning by the Sabi sand. But yeah, a very bit difficult position at the moment, but we will just sit here very quietly. So he's got an impala kill that's in the tree at the moment. So he's got a nice impala it's been stashed up there. All right, it looks good. Oh, you got your elephants calling that side. Oh. oh, sorry, Jared. I heard Jesse nine years old and then he sounded like a robot. Can you just go with Jesse's uh, question again, please? Jesse, yes, most of the leopards in this area do have names. Um, the reason for us naming them is just to keep track on who's who in the zoo here. You know, who's, who's moving where? So like we've got this young male leopard, his name is Marips, coming up to four years old. And, uh, you, know, he's, uh, you know, he's a very well-known leopard for us here on Wild Earth. So it's nice to know that we're here. And then like, you know, maybe a week, two weeks time, we say, hey, we've got Marips at another spot. So at least we can see which area he's moving around in. But yeah, it looks like he's just going to settle. So I might have to, to reposition very shortly. I'm just letting Jared know that we're not going to get any other sighting of him. He's just gone right to the top of this uh, beautiful Tambuti tree. And his kill is stashed away. They're typical with the leopards. So what a leopard does, they will actually hoist, they'll actually hoist their kills up into trees. And why they do that is to keep it out of uh, reach of other predators like your hyenas and your lions. So it's perfect. Not even a lion will try and climb that one. It's just too risky. So yeah, that leopard knows it's got a very safe spot up there. And it looks like he's turning again. I don't think he's got a really uh, comfortable spot there. It's difficult to see. I just see a lot of branches and it moving. But uh, wild animals, they are very resilient, you know, when it comes to injuries, when it comes to, you know, like sprains or, you know, dislocated leg or hip or uh, muscle injury or tissue injury, those kind of things, they, they are very much resilient to that. In other words, meaning resilient, meaning, you know, they heal themselves up very quickly and they need to, you know, wild animals, they can't stay injured for too long because they need to continue doing what they have to do. You know, like this injury with all my reps, unfortunately, uh, you know, this is going to hinder his, uh, his movements for a bit. But, uh, yeah, I'm just so glad I got to see him. Oh, I'm so glad I got to see him. I was really hoping. I just heard a lot about uh, my reps's injury over the last week. And uh, uh, it's so good to see him this side. Anyway, we're going to try and reposition here. And while we do that, let's head over to Steve.
Thanks, Setters. Well, how nice to see our boy. I just want to show you a little track over here. I wonder if we're going to be able to get it in the road there. I'm just going to move forward. The light, I think, is good. Okay. Bless you. Here is a knife. Can you see what I'm looking at? Here's the pad. One, two, three lobes, and then the toes. Four toes. And then there's the other one there. Bless you. We're having a bit of a sneezing fit on the back of the car. There's somebody allergic to grass. I'm not allergic to grass. Okay, so how do we tell what animal this is? Well, measure it. My knife is 10 centimeters, so let me just measure this because it's bigger than 10 centimeters. So let's put this down. Put this down, okay. There's the back and there's the front. Okay, so if I put that there, that takes me to, oh, my knife's the wrong way around. Let me put it that way. If I do that, oh, am I still the wrong way? No, it takes me to about 13, 14 centimeters. Well, that's big, that's bigger. That's the back foot, because here is the front foot back foot is on top of the front foot that's how this animal walks and uh, it's got three lobes like that can you see that panda and then it's got four toes so this is a cat it's a big cat if you looked in any tracking book you'd notice that it's a leopard a male leopard is 10 centimeters a female leopard is about eight centimeters a male lion is about 16 to 15 to maybe 14 centimeters and then a female is about 12 to 13 so this is the back foot of a male lion it's going in that direction Ella which cat has got the most detail is that what you asked me now how do we know if this is a right or left do you know panda you do everybody knows this one okay if you didn't know it's important to know and if you're on a tracking assessment you sometimes can be asked right or left foot now how do you know first of all you'll take your fingers the way that that my fingers go and you'll put your hand in there put your hand in there and which toe in this track is the longest that toe over there do you agree panic can you see it that one is the longest okay so if I put my hand in there my pinky my middle one no my longest is that one so if I put that hand in there yes that matches so that is a right foot so that's how cats they also have longer index what do you call this middle finger they have a longer middle finger leopards and lions do as well and you can see it in a hyena track as well the way that it is um, designed very easy to see in a hyena track because the way the track moves but a lion a leopard we don't always see the way it moves properly but it's a nice way to see left or right and this is the back foot back right foot of a male lion Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms.
Mm. Oh, like I said, very shy. You don't normally find them out in the open plains like this. This is uh, not rare. Um, yeah, you just mo you mostly find them like in the mountainous areas. If it's not the mountainous area, then they'll be in an area where it's s sort of dense with a bit of thicket. It's either the flat, open, open fields where they can see you for almost kilometers. Otherwise, they'll stick to the mountains where they can see something coming up, either behind them or in front of them. You'll never really see a, a big herd of of Hemsburg, really. Uh, you know, they, they like to stick to groups no more than, I suppose, and it's quite big. Uh, generally, no more than 20. Um, you usually you usually see in a herd between about seven, you know, between five, five and fifteen. Let's put it there. That's very vague, but generally speaking, normal. Normally, you find like about ten or eleven in a big group. And uh, funny enough, the males have much shorter horns than the females do. So just like the earland, males' horns are shorter, but then again they are much, much thicker, much thicker for the females, well, much thicker for the males than they are for the females. Females will have these long, thin ones, and males will have these, sh not short, but also fairly long, it's just not as long as the females, and much, much thicker. Sebastian, that is a very, very good question. I'd say between a kudu, a sable, and earland. Chemspok horns are not very, very thick, and they're not. Uh, I've picked. I mean, I've picked them out. They're not very, very heavy. Chemspok for sure. Oh my goodness, that massive head, and uh, kudus. Ooh. Could do have very thick horns, but they're also very, very long. And they can almost do about 1.5 to 2 meters long when you straighten them out. Obviously, you can't straighten them out, but if they were to be straightened out, that's how long they would be. We're going to send you over to Cedric quickly. All right, he's coming down now. Uh, so we just went to on the other side. He's just coming to, to his kill. He might come onto this fallen over side here. Let's see what he does. But it looks like he might be on his kill now. So this young male leopard, Holmerips. I don't know why he climbed right to the top there. It looked so uncomfortable, especially when we came around to this side now. Well, let's see what he's doing. It looks like he's resting there now. Oh, all right. Jared, yeah, we'll have to go all the way around again. It's going to take us a bit of time. Unfortunately, we also have to pull down our aerial because we have to sneak under one or two of the branches. That's very low. And then you lose signal. But he is resting. I can see his legs are dangling now. I can just see his legs dangling. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, move around. Let's move around. So we're going to go all the way around. We're going to just do a very wide berth. I don't want to go too close to the tree at all. I'd rather do it. But yes, uh, to all the kids, thank you so much for joining us on the Kids Drive this afternoon. We do appreciate it. Thank you so much for all the comments and all the questions that you've sent through. As always, we love it. And uh, once again, please make sure that you do tune in to the Kids uh, Drive tomorrow afternoon, same place, same time, from 3.30 to 4.30 Central African time. Bye. Okay, let's go around here. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.
All right, so we're just trying to get to the other side. <laughs> You're right there. Yeah. We're just trying to get to the other side of this drainage line, yeah? And as we say, we're just trying to do a, a huge loop, a wide berth around him. I don't want to go too close to him there. All right. Can I try and go? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll have to try and... Come on, come on, Wendy. There we go. Yay. All right. Well, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera on Wendy, we got muscles and poor his teddy bear. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get past here. Oh, you're right there. You're fine. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right, we'll just have to, have to let the aerial down here. Yeah? So I'm hoping we're not going to lose signal. All right, let's go. Not uh, a spot. Jared, are you still there? So I just want to see if Jared's still got our signal. Oh, you're still there. All right. Oh, all right, fantastic. Thanks, Jared. All right, so what we're trying to do, I just want to have a closer look there with his, uh, his wound. <laughs> yeah, look, I. Uh, Honestly, to be to be honest, uh, it, it's not. It doesn't look great at all. Um, that wound of his looks very open. You're right, then, Paul. Yeah. You, have you got a wound now? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we must stitch you up. <laughs> Get the vet in for you as well. <laughs> Maurice, yes. Uh, oh, <clears throat> I am almost. But I, honestly, honestly, I'm actually tearing up a bit yeah just when I saw that wound and and just seeing the boy being feeling like that yeah it's it's something that you don't like but I'm just glad that we found him I'm glad that the guides at that time around yeah I'm glad James got into here as well and uh, to pick up on uh, Marips and to get the Sabi Sands out here to get the vets out here so quickly you know that it just gives him that that chance a chance of survival without finding him yeah uh, it could end up bad all right, we're going to try and see what we can do here. I just want to see. Yeah, we're going to get a nice shot here. Nice view of him here. Hey, my boy. We've got a lovely view of him here. Looks like he might be eating. Let's first see what we can do. Yeah. Chili beans, yes, thank you. It's good to be back, but yeah, let's see what we can do, yeah? As I said, I don't want to, just let me know, Paul. You... Yep. All right, that's good at his eat. On <laughs> That was quite a bit of a mission to get through there. All right, so he's busy feeding. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly let go of the vehicle there. You all right then? It's strong, very important, Dan. and apparently James told me is This morning we did have some lines, Cedric's probably going to fall that one.
right, so sorry, I do apologize about earlier. It just uh, seems like our signal just dropped for a little bit there, but we, we're still here with Mareps, this young male leopard. Still busy feeding on uh, the Impala kill. That's just uh, pretty much hoisted up in this beautiful Tamboti tree. Now, I don't know if you heard me earlier, I was actually saying that so James told me now today that he did get hold of the Sabi, or the Sabi Sands got hold of him, just to see if he's still here, because uh, the Sabi Sands and the vets are very interested in coming back here tomorrow morning um, to follow up on him and um, maybe just to give him another a dose of antibiotics and uh, see how the wound is coming along. So they are going to come and do that tomorrow morning, which is fantastic. Because honestly, for me, yeah, oof, I, I, I actually, I, I, while, I was, <laughs> while I'm sitting here, I can actually feel his pain. I, can, I, I feel it. It's, it's, yeah, that's a deep, deep, deep wound. But, you know, that's one thing about, uh, you saw Tavangumi, for instance, that other male leopard. But even, I think his, his wound was even way worse, where they actually had to stitch all right around his entire body. And you saw him, and uh, well, we saw him on that last day, and uh, you could see how quickly that wound was actually healing up, and how he was moving. So, you know, for the, the chances of uh, this young male leopard healing up and continuing, continuing with his uh, with his life is very good, very very good. You know, and as long as we can keep an eye on him, um, as long as we can see how his behaviour is. And as long as he's getting, keeping some food in, or getting some food in that belly, that is very important. And it's good that he's got an appetite. So if you know, if you've just really joined us, um, with uh, with understanding about what happened to why has he got that big uh, wound on him? Well, about a week ago, um, a couple, one of the guides, and of course James came into the area as well, found him with a snare. Now, a snare is a piece of wire that usually a lot of people tend to, you know, you know, tend to go look for bush meat around these areas. You know, not in the air, but more closer to the fence lines and all that. And then they set up these snares, which is such a horrible thing, absolutely a horrible thing, to try and get bush meat. Um, and of course, uh, this young male leopard must have walked through one of those snares, and it pretty much got uh, stuck around his body. And he tried to get out, and you can see it dug quite deep into his flesh and everything. And uh, let's just say once again, luckily that the guy that was around to get the Sabi Sands out here, to get the vets out here very quickly, I mean, in a matter of hours. And they treated him and uh, made sure that at least he's got something to eat here while he tries to recover. And then for this young male, he wants to be moving, you know, he wants to be a young male leopard looking for a territory, you know, and he's setting up his area more up to the, to the northern areas where Tavangumi used to be. And you know, going up that side, it looks like he wants to come down here now. I didn't eat too much, and a little bit there. Yeah, right here, Paul must have tried. We'll just stick here, let's just stick here. Yeah. You can't do much here. It's stuck to this little position here. It looks like his left side is not bad. It's like oh, the left side is more like around the neck. When it comes to the right side, it comes like around his leg, like behind his shoulder blade. Anyway, well, we're going to just sit here for a little bit longer. Let's head over to uh, Steve as he wants to say good afternoon to everybody. Mm, so this, you must be super stoked in a way to be seeing him. Poly, poly. Sorry about the radio. So everybody, we've got a... I was looking at a heron for the longest time and Pana didn't zoom in too much. I didn't see that the heron is having a fat conversation here with a bonnet lizard. And if the uh, heron is saying, you're years behind in your evolutionary process, lizard, look at you, lying flat on the ground 
solar panel scales on the body. Look at me, I am long with feathers and I can fly. <laughs> you reckon, Panda, that's what he's saying? They are, they're having a fat conversation there. And there we go. That's what Darren said to the monitor lizard. Cat. <laughs> Catch me if you can. How splendid was that? It's not often you hear the herons call. They do call, but not often. Sorry about my head. You got me there, panda. You got me. <laughs> well, we're just having fun this afternoon, everybody, out and about. Seeing what we can find, seeing Chitwe. We've been told that um, Impala and Yalas have been going crazy around Mike's Kitchen, the open area on Chitwe. And we should go and check it out because the guys around here have not found a leopard yet in the last few days. So we should give it a go. And our monitor lizard is going to show us how to leopard crawl. This is how you do the leopard crawl. Margo, we might find Langa or Kuchava. How nice would that be? Langa, I feel, has been sort of more to the little Gauri side towards Hoffman, so a bit more west from where we are. I haven't seen her in ages, but just from where she's been hanging out, where I've been hearing the reports, I know she was seen lots on Chitra in her early days, and I'm sure she still moves through here, but she seems to have taken up residence more towards the east, uh, west of here. Um, and this is definitely Kuchava's sort of spot. But look at that monitor lizard, I suppose. It's a big one, eh? Sometimes it's easy to tell the water versus the rock. And I feel like this is a water with a long snout. It's a massive one. And it's pregnant. Something's going on. It might have eaten the heron's friend, the other heron. There's a heron inside the belly. Maybe that's why the heron was getting upset. It's trying to plead with it and say, please give me back my friend. And then after failed negotiations, the heron has flown off. I don't think I've ever seen a monitor lizard with such a big belly there. Do you like these guys, Panda? You do, you like them, eh? Hey? They, they're nice. That's a very diplomatic way of saying it. Now look how it swings its toes around there, everybody. Those very long claws. You can often see that in the track, that little dragging of the toenails. And when it moves a bit quicker, you don't see the belly drag on the ground. You might just see the tail and those claws. Carlis, you love the way they move. I mean, this is about as good as it gets. He's definitely doing the monitor lizard shuffle. And the jacana just landed atop of Frey, and that was cool. We'll get to you just now. We're just enjoying. I love the that Austin Powers when he uh, suddenly stop. He's going to get run over by the steamroller and you realize he's actually like a hundred meters away from it. It's kind of like that now, Pan. Are we being charged by this monitor lizard? Stop! Oh, panic! <laughs> oh, I'm only joking, everybody. They don't charge. They really don't. If anything, they run away. It almost looks like a cartoon, the way when they do run their four legs sort of spiral, go into these like helicopter motion as they move oh totally happy Brit that is the proper swagger the don't mess with me kind of swagger and I'm still thinking it's a water monitor but as it's getting closer the uh, the face is looking more and more rock monitor-esque to me I mean the water monitors are generally a little bit longer and slender with a longer nose but this is a fatty. Uh, that is definitely. Oh, 
Well, you, you are a water monitor, I do believe. Look at that belly, everyone. Goodness gracious. Prehistoric, isn't it? Prehistoric. It's just lowering down. Mm, that was heavy work. Almost like there's something in its throat as well. Nicely camouflaged. I mean, obviously they are at risk from leopards and lions, but their greatest risk comes from the birds of prey from the sky, namely the Marshall Eagle. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. Uh, we're still here with uh, Marips, this young male leopard. Um, and of course, we're not going to stay here much longer now. So I just wanted to see if he's going to come down decently, just to, um, how can I say, um, observe the, the injury and uh, to see how how he's moving. But he's still moving very gingerly. So as I say, we're going to do maybe another two, three minutes here, and then we're going to leave him to be, let him rest and uh, hoping that tomorrow morning we'll come and follow up here again and uh, and if we do find him tomorrow morning we will be staying a little bit longer due to the fact of uh, trying to get the sobby sands into this area and keeping eyes on him but it looks like he's lying down and catching flies as leopards should do and it's a good thing he must just lick his wound that's one thing that's always in the saliva, a lot of healing agents inside of their saliva. So you always find lions or dogs, hyenas. If they've got an injury, they always lick their wound. I'm trying to just lick it clean, as well as trying to get it to heal much quicker. <laughs> He's 
I think the flies must be irritating him quite a bit, especially that you've got an open wound. You don't know, want the flies to land on there. Uh, a nice full belly at least. He's got uh, enough protein inside of that belly. So he can rest nicely for the evening. Jane M, you say you'd love to think that Lalamba is concerned for Maripsis' injury and supporting him in his recovery. Do you think that's possible? Uh, Jane M, nah, you know, that's uh, leopards is leopards. At the end of the day, you'll find they are very much solitary cats and individual cats. And, uh, you know, she's not going to come here and really worry about his injury. You know, she's going to be more worried about, yeah, well, there's some food up here in, that, in this Tamboiti tree. Can I get to it? He's, yeah, maybe he's going to, well, apparently, like James told me, that he wasn't happy with uh, Tlalumba coming here the other day and he growled at her and snarled at her and actually chased her off from this area. So it just shows you, you know, he's not going to hang around for that. You know, he's still going to act like a leopard and still try and protect his meal. <coughs> Sky Doogie, you see Marips was mating with Kara uh, yeah, only two months ago, that's true. And so where, uh, so where is she? I'm not too sure where Kara is. Kara is, Kara, she's also missing for quite some time now. But remember, she was missing and then all of a sudden she reappeared. So, uh, is she, and I don't know if she's pregnant because I know Marips was mating with her two months ago. So that is quite interesting. Uh, Marips is going to want to do territorial patrols if she's carrying his cubs. Exactly. I mean, Marips is four years old. He's just past four years old now. So, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. well, if he mated with her and if she pretty much took well, you know, during that time, uh, it's not going to be good in a way, especially that he's not hanging around that area anymore at this point in time due to this injury. And there's other males like uh, the Timbavati male that's come into that area. So I think that, that void that was pretty much left open by uh, Tabungumi, has been really much almost being filled up by other males at this point of time so as so for him for this young male to be away from that side for such a long time now it's not a good thing you know but the only time will tell and see where what plays out here and i'm just hoping that this young male leopard decides uh, you know, set up a nice territory away from those areas of, you know, where there's a lot of snares around and that's, uh... but yeah, well, while we're going to start making our way out from this uh, sighting, uh, let's head over to uh, Stivo as he's sitting at Chitwa Dam. Thanks, Setters. We are indeed still at Chitwe. We moved on from our enormous monitor visit and uh, as promised, checking out on our little Jakana. Widespread and abundant in the wetlands of South Africa. The diet of aquatic insects for the most part. Their larvae, small spiders, even small fish if they can catch them. But those enormous feet enabling them to access and move through areas that many other birds wouldn't be able to, like giant snowshoes. Here comes the female. Oh, you see the size difference. Goodness gracious, it's so pronounced, isn't it? She's almost twice his weight. One of the few polyandrous species. Della, what a stunning scene. Indeed. You might have heard me say the word polyandrous. What does that mean? Do you know what that means, Panda? Polyandry. So mean? polygamous is quite well known. Everybody knows polygamy when there's a male who has more than one female. So we talk about impala, buffalo, elephant, that whole story of where the male mates with many. 
polyandry is the opposite when it's the female who actually mates with more than one. So the African jacana is one of few species we find in South Africa where the male will mate with the female and then he, once the eggs are laid, he will look after the eggs and he'll look after the chicks and she'll go off and meet another male jacana and carry on the story elsewhere. So all parental care and rearing of the chicks is done by the male, which is quite cool. And it's quite interesting how much bigger she is. I don't know what the purpose of that would be. You know, often we find um, birds of prey being, the female being larger than the male because she generally spends more time incubating or on the nest while he's around securing food for her while she's at the nest incubating, but she doesn't do that. So the purpose of her being much bigger than him, it puts them in a different food category. You know, maybe she, he can access areas that are a little bit more light-footed, so to speak, where she has to be a little bit closer to the shore where she's a bit heavier, she's almost twice his weight. So a lot of the time we find birds that have different sizes, either length of beak or size of body enables them to not compete as heavily with each other. So they both occupy different feeding niches within their own environment. It's generally one of the cases. Wood hoopoos, for example, the male's beaks are a little bit longer and a bit more curved than the female, so they can access slightly different area in the bark and woody substrate than the female can. So lots of insects that think they've escaped predation. Did you hear that, Panda? Oh. Avery, you want to know which bird's foot structure? Well, I feel like foot structure evolved from a very basic foot. So like a ground nesting bird um, with three toes forward and no back toe, I think would have been the primitive old types of foot structures. Um, birds that we find out in the water like jacanas their foot structures evolved to enable them to walk on on very light sort of floating vegetation cormorants and darters have evolved very well developed paddle like feet which enables them to to swim and to not only swim but to dive so that's very very well developed and advanced but then we've gone into the perching variety where birds are able to to cling and clasp to trees and branches and to bark and that's taken a fair bit of evolution um, for birds to have gotten that far but I feel like the mouse birds have probably taken it to the next level and I did mention it yesterday on, on safari if any of you are watching um, but the mouse bird has the ability I'm not hearing him there um, okay well we'll carry on that a bit later and let's send you back over to Eric Oh my goodness, have a look at this. Wow, we, we've been on a search party. When I say for the last hour, we've been driving circles and circles and circles. I've seen so many different tracks. Uh, it's been difficult, but we've finally, we've finally won. They, well, I didn't find them. They found us, per se. This is pretty cool. So these are the sub these are the sub adults. This is Millie, Molly, and Mandy. All just very relaxed here. Not too sure where the rest are. We were looking for a uh, mom, mom or the aunt. I'm not too sure who it was, um, but there was a lion very close to where those monkeys were. So those monkeys actually they did try and warn us. Um, 
but uh, we were unable to come right. I know that other guides did manage to see her. She was moving around. They didn't know if she was hunting or if she was possibly coming to try and find the cubs. No one knew what the story was, but she was on the move. As are these guys, they all, obviously they're sitting down now. Oh, look at that, 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 that little gaze. She gave us the criminal side eye. So, this is the first time we've seen lions in just under three weeks. It's the whole shift. We haven't... This is the first time we have lions on air since uh, the 1st of April. Well, not since the 1st of April, since the last time we saw them, so more than that. Haven't seen these lions in probably five weeks now, that's about. Oh, it's a very long time. All right, now, as you know, there is a Wild Earth YouTube membership program, and there are some, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some great, great benefits. The best one being an ad-free stream, so you can rewind, you can pause, you can fast forward, after, obviously after you've paused, but uh, the main thing, it is an ad-free stream line basically now the youtube channel all you have to do is just click to, well click join to find out more and it's uh it's it's a very simple pro process i was about to say progress it's a very simple process most uh, of, of the smart tvs nowadays have youtube already preloaded on the tv all you have to do is search wild earth Click join membership program to become part of it. Let us follow these lines. They, I think where they're going is a little pan on the other side here. So I, I really hope they don't drink the water from there because I know that pan is a filthy, filthy pan. But um, we're going to stick with them. So you never know what we might be able to find here. Uh, yeah, they're in an area where, like I said, there's lots of warthogs, there's lots of little dacre, you know, there's, uh, there'll be bush pig here in this area. Morgan's just going to wipe the lens. It, it's not raining on us, but this slow-lying mist is not good for, for the screen. Okay, I'm, okay, okay, I see you getting up and looking at us with intent. We don't deserve those eyes. I know you're hungry. But you'll have to keep looking if you want a food source. A beautiful, beautiful female lionesses we've got here. And uh, they, uh, they're getting big. They're getting really, really, really big. Canine girl, indeed, the beautiful pride. Or oh, half pride now. Obviously. Uh, we are still missing Mike, the young male. Guapo is not here. He's probably lying fast asleep under a bush somewhere. And then, of course, obviously, mom and the aunt also missing in action. They're kind of just moseying about, really. Not really walking with intention. You know, you can see that they. It's not that they don't know where they're going. It's just that they, they're taking their time while doing it. And it's good for them to you know to explore by themselves. You know, most of the time they've been led up here by mom, or their aunt. So it's, yeah, it's very good that they. They here. And right, let us get. Let us. The name Mike uh, is a name that I've given him. 
it obviously had to start with an M and Mike was the first one that came to Michael too long um, obviously Millie Molly Mandy and Mike so it's the, the four M's but it's uh, it's not a name that the reserve has given them it's uh, more of a nickname that I've given them I even gave uh, the the aunt and the mom a nickname too. Mom's name is Patricia. Sorry, not Patricia. Patricia is the aunt and Patsy is mom. Now they're going to this little pan here. We haven't been to this pan since the rain would have changed. Oh, this looks slightly different. Drink, 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 drink. Nothing like a little bit of water to quench the thirst. So, they're drinking very loudly. Julie B, this is amazing. Yo. I couldn't be more happier. Honestly, this is the sighting of the day here at Amakala. We were struggling to find our cats. We struggled with Miss Pumalela this morning. And then we struggled again. Oh, they're very, very thirsty kitties. Now, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news in this amazing time. But unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, we, this is the last drive Morgan and I will be here until the 1st of May, where we will be streaming live once more. So just short of two weeks, we will not be here. So you'll be stuck with Cedric and Steve, but we will return for some more action here at Amakala. And I think this is uh, no, no better time to have seen the lions. Otherwise, we would have gone a whole shift and...
Welcome back live everybody. We just got a wonderful emotional response from our director Jared there. Don't often get many big emotional responses. He said, oh, that looks rad. <laughs> nice Jared, it does indeed look rad. Look at that, all the best rolling in the dirt here on Chitu with the sun sort of descending in the west behind them. The Chitra wildebeest migration in full swing. We are hanging around this open area to find that, uh, that leopard everyone's been talking about. We'll enjoy the nice green, verdant green grasses and swatting at the flies that love to land right on the nose. I might invest in the cork hat on my leave. <laughs> Although seeing the wildlife is always very special, they do come with their insects. <laughs> There's a nice youngster, probably born in December. Amazing how quickly those horns can grow. Fast growth spurts of the plains animals. The lawnmower service is moving in a line directly towards us. Holly, we're feeling great. We are feeling great. Apart from some flies landing on our faces, life is really good at the moment. Splendid scenes with wildebeest in the open. <laughs> flies are <laughs> non-stop. But we'll, we'll survive them, don't worry. We do have some wonderful opportunities to position ourselves and to view some splendid things and, and sometimes game drives can be quite busy. Sometimes it can be pretty quiet where oh Senegal lapwings taking off there. Not a common feature in these areas, although we have been seeing a few Senegal lapwings of late. As, as they interrupted me, I was going to say sometimes on these quieter drives, it's we focus on the little things like the birds, the jacanas. the lapwings, the wildebeest rolling in the sand. A40, it'd be too hot for that, I think. Probably way too hot for that. I mean, it's just they're ticklish. They land right on the face and they go into my ear, and in my nose. And we, and we know they've been on animals' bottoms as well. I know Steph who used to work here used to get very irritated with flies because he knows that they've landed on some animal's poo. Now they want to land on your face. Makes you makes you excited, doesn't it? And they they tena they they tenacious. They'll land on the exact same spot that you just wave them from again and again and again. <laughs> there are worse things in the world to worry about though. But if you don't like insects, everybody, I do not recommend you coming to these parts of the world on safari in the summer months. 
save it for the winter where there's far less insects otherwise you are going to get insects it's just the way it goes so my brother's girlfriend calls them beasties from Scotland I think they call anything that's a creepy crawly a beastie oh, look at that Natal red top grass growing there is it Natal red top might be herringbone it might be the bottle brush actually mm. you can see the little red in the wildebeest fur or is that the way the light's catching it's hard to say these cameras really are next level hey panda they are next level canon thank you for some wonderful technology the detail that we're seeing is just unreal so everybody the 22nd of April is fast approaching and it is Earth Day Wild Earth are celebrating Earth Week uh, this year's theme is planet versus plastics. I think that should be every year's theme to be honest 22nd of April until the 27th of April 2024 Just next week we will play out one stunning insert per day of Earth Week and Monday and Tuesday will see us going live for both PM drives We'll be live on both the sunset safari drives on Monday and Tuesday. That's all I have to say. No? <laughs> mm, full of that. Oh. They are. I mean, we had the wildebeest from the other side and then they started moving more to the side and I thought well as James said it's all about placement you know we sometimes get some incredible shots on our cameras but it's all about being in the right place at the right time it's all about opportunity they love to give themselves a little scratch in the sand so that kind of behavior of all the best rolling in the sand is what is one of the reasons why they are quite destructive to an area when they're in large number if they don't leave the disturbance they create is very natural it's very normal but uh, if they become sedentary which is what wildebeest have become in the Kruger because they can't migrate then they lead to degradation and destruction of the herbaceous layer the grass layer and obviously that disturbance is natural but if not curbed not mitigated through migration that can lead to erosion Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms.
So this is uh, the second little perch spot that we moved to. Obviously the last one that we were sitting at, we couldn't really see them because they were sitting behind that acacia tree, not the acacia tree, the vichilia that is on the right hand side, well our right hand side of them, was blocking our way. Oh, it's time. Has it been a long day? You know, this is what you see lions doing most of the time, is slipping. Being one of the most dangerous animals in Africa, it, it takes a toll on you. You must rest. And here they do nothing but just terrorize the warthogs and take care of the numbers. We do have a, a large amount of warthogs on this property. They do seem fairly, fairly content. I don't think they'll be here forever. I think what's going to happen is they're probably going to move off from here fairly soonish. Tiger boss, no, no, none of these uh, females are pregnant. Um, it's possible the aunt of these three could well be pregnant, as uh, well. Guapo's been mating with her. Uh, when did he? When was he last seen mating? He's been the first time we actually saw him mating with her was probably around November, December last year. Um, and then, uh, obviously, he did some more. There was some more mating in January. <clears throat> so, if we are to be expecting cubs, they'll probably arrive, maybe. Hmm. It's generally four months that a female lion is pregnant for. It should be... Uh, around June, July, maybe. But we will, we will see. We will see. We actually have to look at her to be able to tell, to see if her belly's a bit bigger than usual. But uh, we, obviously, we don't have her in front of us here. But uh, I'm sure, obviously, in the next shift, we will hopefully be able to see her and see what progress or if her little baby bump is actually a baby bump and how it's coming along we're gonna sit here a little bit longer oh reunited we're gonna sit a little bit longer but in the meantime we're gonna send you over to steve to see well see the last little bit of light in juma it's nap time mm. welcome back everyone welcome to the sunset reflective moment here on Chitra Chitra Airstrip. It's been a, a wonderful three week stint for me. It's been some very big highs and there's been one very big low. But all in all it's been again another remarkable experience out here in the wild places. And we're halfway through the month of April and quickly approaching, believe it or not, the middle of the year. Just a moment to reflect on where you find yourself in this exact moment. In this life that you are living. It's your life. Do you find yourself caught up on excuses, reasons for not doing things in a different way. I found I had to do a lot of work 
realize that everything that goes wrong in my life is happening within myself. Shifting that mental mindset. A powerful shift. Placing every negative thought with a positive bias. What can I benefit from this rather than complaining, finding the negative? It's very easy to find a negative more challenging to find a positive and I've been making a very conscious effort to just shower myself with positivity, gratitude and self-love. I wish that for all of you, wherever you find yourselves. And, mm, nice big breath. I've been making a conscious effort to laugh more, not just at life, but at myself. I catch myself coming up with that story or finding something you're looking for missing and then you immediately want to blame someone and then realizing it was you who moved it, and laughing at that. The stories that we hold on to. Making a choice to just let things go. Let things go. Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> oh. Wild Earth is turning 17 and we want to make the years count. <laughs> 17 years of achievements, close encounters and special memories. He's got it, he's got it and he's straight up a tree. Come along as we reflect on our top 17 greatest moments. Here's to more years of connecting you to nature. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
feel being in nature is so healing. It helps one to drop into the present moment. Obviously sunsets and sunrises are beautiful and they drop us in. There's a beauty about them that is alluring and pulls us in and we, we lose train of thought in that moment. But when we know that we can do that in any single moment with absolutely anything that is coming up for us, we have that choice to either hold on, by all means, if you feel like holding on to the negativity and going on and on that same story, please do so. There's a free choice. But the knowledge that we can just choose a different outcome in the moment. Feel it if you need to feel it. Let it come through you. Feel it. Let it go. So obviously at the end of <clears throat> our last little segment, that one that's now lying all out in the open, she came from the left-hand side and she rejoined this little huddle of the three. The other one that was lying in between the two of them there has just got up and she's on the move, but I think she's sat down behind that sweet thorn. I did see her face come out the other side, but I didn't see her whole body come out. So she's obviously still lying there. And they are, well, one of them is catching a few winks while the others keep watch out. And this is very clever, clever behavior by some lions. If, you're, if they are wanting to or something to eat for dinner tonight. It's just wait by a waterhole. Something ought to come down here at some stage. Obviously on a hot day it would have been better. It's now no longer hot. It's uh, she's starting to get a bit chilly, I must say. This, uh, the wind compared with this very, very light mist it's not the greatest. We're going to sit here a little bit longer now. Uh, we're sending you over now to watch a clip of James. Bearing in mind, this is also during our virtual safari day. So this is non-live content. Have a look-see. It's a misty Monday morning here on the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. I'm full of gratitude for the fact that I'm not in the traffic, but about to go off towards the east and see if we can find some leopard tracks. Hopefully Tlalamba, the female, who we think has a den in that area. I'm surrounded by beautiful plumbago flowers here. Amazing splash for a Monday morning. And there's a hyena walking just behind us there. We'll quickly have a look at him. Well, that hyena suddenly taken off, and I don't know where he's going. He's heading fast towards the northwest. And maybe we'll catch up with him, and maybe he's heard something or smelt something that our inferior human senses have been unable to. Right, we've got four hyenas here. They look like they've had a big fat meal last night, and I wonder if the lions that Steve is looking for didn't kill something that these chaps pilfered. Now all four of these hyenas seem to be marking their territory around here. The smell coming off them is something atrocious. Some kind of rotting meat during the course of the night or certainly in the midst of some viscera and now they're anal pasting around 
this area and having a little social interaction, which is no doubt important to the workings of the clan. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that one at the front there is June with this floppy ear, famous hyena of the Juma clan. And this very much has the look of a clan of hyenas on the way home after a night of foraging and feasting. The sun has just come up. Gorgeous red orb peeping through the clouds there as these hyenas ghost across this grassy clearing. We followed those hyenas, they went into the bush, we lost them. They popped out onto the road here towards the old den site, so we're going to go and check there. But on the way there, we have been blocked by a magnificent herd of five or six elephants. I suppose the best kind of Monday morning traffic. He's decided to come and take his frustrations out on us. His pre-teen frustrations. I wonder if the other bull wasn't teasing this one because as you can see his head is <laughs> he's extremely hairy for an elephant. He's retained some of his very young calf fluff. Sorry old boy, it'll probably Unlike with human beings, of course, an elephant longs for the day that his fluff disappears. I long for the day that I had fluff on the top of my head. Right, we're going to leave these elephants grazing down the hill here, and we're going to carry on off towards the east and see if we can pick up the leopard tracks that we originally intended to find. We've just come driving along the road here, and there is Tlalamba the leopardess waiting to say hello. <laughs> I nearly ran her over. I had to slam the car into reverse and go back. And she's marking her territory here. Now, she is in the vicinity where her injured brother Maripse has been. And I wonder if she isn't going to go and check on the stash of food that he has in a tree not far from here. I hoped we'd find her, and we have. But we also want to check on how Maribs is doing. Now, I think she can actually see now that there's another leopard in that tree. And in her typical chilled Tlalamba way, she doesn't seem particularly phased by the situation. And while this could be completely erroneous anthropomorphizing, I would say that that sort of behavior is totally unlike her mother, Tandi. Her mother would have been enraged. She's much more chilled like her dad used to be. There, there, there. Maribs is moving in the tree. He spotted her. He's seen her now. And now she's showing submission. See that? She's demonstrating submission. That is Maribs. I can see his injury. Okay, so this is good news. This is great news. He's growling at her. She's moving down. Right, 
Right, so he's up the tree, he's got his kills, he's certainly been fairly threatening towards Tlalumba. I don't know if she's close by or if she's decided to move off and leave him alone. But this is the best possible place for him to be right now. Lots of food, safe in a tree. And definitely, certainly feeling fit enough to try and chase his sister off. So at the moment, things looking up for Maribse. And hopefully they will continue to do so until that wound heals and he's put on some weight. Maribse is just up in the branches. I'm not sure if he's going to feed or if he's about to come down. But whatever the case, he'll rest here for the rest of the day. Might be in the tree, might be on the ground where it's a bit more comfortable than on the spiky branches. What an utterly spectacular morning. Right, welcome back, and uh, that is uh, nice. It looks like James had uh, some fantastic uh, sightings over the last uh, few days there on Monday and Tuesday, which is brilliant. But, uh, okay, so what's happened now, interesting story here now. So we did leave Mareps, but while we were leaving Mareps, we had a, 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 a burst tire. I mean, it wasn't, we were like about 20 meters, 30 meters away from where he was, and I got a sidewall puncture, and uh, it just went <laughs> <clears throat> so we had to change the tire there because we could not even move any further um, due to a very, very flat tire. And then while we were busy changing the tire, um, of course, uh, the Sabi Sands then uh, rocked up there at uh, Marips and uh, they went to, they just asked me quickly if he's there. I said, yes, he's there, he's in the, in the drainage line and all that. And then said, okay, wonderful. And then they told me, well, tomorrow morning, they're just planning for tomorrow morning because they've got some intervention for sorting out uh, Marips completely. As you know, that male leopard's got uh, such a deep wound. It seems like he stitches that they, he was stitched up a little bit under his, uh, his one leg side, his front leg, because it was very deep there. So, um, but it looks like those uh, stitches have pulled out because they're very flimsy stitches. So they're getting a proper... Um, how can I say, not a problem, but a, a surgeon, a veterinary surgeon coming in tomorrow, uh, very specialized in uh, wild animals and stitching wild animals up and all that. So they're coming in tomorrow morning uh, with a few other um, uh, specialists to come and take a look at him to try and uh, doctor that wound uh, up much more um, as it is not looking great at all. So yes, I think... Uh, there's a lot of effort by the Sabi Sand um, to make sure that uh, this young male leopard is going to pull through. So, crossing fingers. Um, um, yeah, to see if uh, that all comes right. But as I say, they've got specialists coming out. Shiv, uh, I'm not too sure. I haven't really been with uh, the new vehicle. I'm not too sure. Yes, with a new vehicle, I can I can put that Land Cruiser anywhere. <laughs> anywhere where this Land Rover goes, I can go with that Land Cruiser. I'm sure James doesn't want to hear that at the moment from me. But uh, I, I've driven a Land Cruiser many a time. Most of my career, a guiding career, I've been in a Land Cruiser. So I know a Land Cruiser quite well. Um, so yes, I'll be able to get the Land Cruiser in there. No problem. Um, on top of that as well is uh, the signal. So the signal will be the situation, the, the issue. So I don't know how the signal is with uh, the new vehicle. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll, be able, I'll be able to get in there for the Land Cruiser. No problemo. I don't, I don't think I'll be too popular amongst the, the head of Wild Earth uh, management there but uh, anyway <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I'll get there all right anyway changing topic very swiftly yeah and uh, well what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go slowly south on this road that I'm on now go towards Vuyotela access I'm on the northeast uh, northwestern corner of Juma presently and just uh, yeah, I'm just gonna scan around here yeah, and see if we get any lucky nocturnal critters that might be moving around for us uh, 
this evening. It would be nice. Nice to get a Janet or an Al. Bush babies. I actually saw a bush baby two days ago when I was coming into camp. I saw a little bush baby, well, not two days ago, it was yesterday. Oh, two days ago, yesterday. And uh, I'll cross one of the roads here. Very cute. Anyway, well, we're going to slowly amble down this road to see what we can pick up on, and uh, hopefully we get a surprise around one of these corners. Let's head over to Steve. Well, welcome back to the Sentinel, everybody. Now, Cedric's asking if the Sentinel will be able to get in there. I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure it'll get in there. Um, it'll take about a 400 degree turn to turn around and I'm not the first one who's going to get this vehicle scratched. Nope. <laughs> James already put a warning out last night. First one to damage the vehicle is getting 50 lashes at noon. You all thought he was joking, didn't you? He's joking. It's going to be at the morning after breakfast. <laughs> as soon as you get your sugar spike, it's the best time to get lashes, apparently. Joking, I've no idea when's the best time to get lashes, everybody, but uh, you know, I don't want to be the first one to, to scratch this car. And going in there where my ribs is, uh, this car is about about half a foot wider than uh, Wendy and it's about 200 meters longer so yeah it's gonna be <laughs> interesting I know the Sabi Sands they've come in a few times but they go in generally with us to see where he is because uh, from their angle well from the cruiser angle it's tricky it's very tricky to do not impossible, not impossible, but it's it's going to come with its scratches and scrapes. And uh, I'm going to leave that to Cedric and Amy. Amy is going to be coming in this evening, I believe, and she's whopping with me in the morning. So we'll see. I gave a Sentinel a good wash today and a, a wipe down and almost scratch free. There's a couple of little scratches, but we are in the African wilderness. But uh, I've taken Sentinel off road at Gary Dam, pretty much through the open area to see our mail line the other day, and that is it. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to be that guy. See, like even here, these guaries they make me worry a little bit, but don't worry, it's only a guari. Donna, this week coming, this week coming, it's only for Earth Week, the, A, the, the PM drive, Earth Week, Monday, Tuesday coming, you heard correctly, not, not indefinitely for the AM and PM drives, only for Monday, Tuesday next week. I hope that's clear. We shall, um, we shall tweet it and reshare it and make sure that it's, it's known by everybody. Nearly spotlight time, very, very nearly.
Now you're going to hear there are some other vehicles that are going to start approaching us. We were very, very lucky and we had the sighting all to ourselves, but now we have to start sharing. Well, that's fine as Barney always says, sharing is caring. There should be another two other rangers joining us in the sighting. And uh, the one that they're probably going to be able to see is the female that's just disappeared behind the bush. Well, not just disappeared, a, car, uh, well, a while ago she disappeared behind the bush. Just right, she's switching to infrared now as it is starting to get very, very, very dark. Very, very dark indeed. Oh, our guests have arrived. Well, not our guests, but the guests have arrived with their guide. <laughs> She's awake now. Now, this is a very sticky, sticky spot, so trying to find a space to view them is very difficult. All right, thanks, Yo. We are now just uh, <coughs> coming down on the western side of uh, Juma. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just going to just trying to look if we can maybe find a chameleon, or even on these, some of these open clearings, it's always nice to look out for something like a, a white-tailed mongoose that might be roaming around these areas. Sometimes a genet, African wild cat, a good old nocturnal animal somewhere. Yeah. But it's always funny, like I always say, things happen in, you know, in, in like clubs, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not just one thing. It's like, it's like this afternoon, for instance, you know, of course, got my rips there. And, um, you know, it's just, it was a little bit like, how can I say, a little bit hard sourcing in that way. And then coming out of the sighting, having a flat, or like getting a flat tire as we were, you know, leaving that sighting. And then we had to change the flat tire and uh, the vehicle started pushing to one side because we were on a bit of a, a slant there. And then the Sabi sand people came in at, this, at that time. So everything just happened at once, you know, and that's typical like with life. It's amazing how that it always plays out like that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> And once if something funny happens, just expect more things to happen after that. Be prepared. Be ready. But we came out of it, came out of it, alright. We got the tire on nicely. And I'll pull him, of course, and pause her back. He also pulled a muscle in his back the other day. So he's also suffering a little bit of, uh, how can I say, back issues and all that, which I can understand. He picks up a lot of weights per day. You know, and uh, so he did his back in. So I gave him a little bit of DP to last night. So I'm hoping that uh, he's going to be using that and sorting his uh, yes. back out. So of course now during picking up the tire, the you know the the spare tire and taking the flat one off, you know, I felt very I felt bad. You know I don't I don't want the poor guy to you know pick up the entire tire. I know he, he, he can do it. He can actually pick up two tires at once if he needs to. You know one in each arm, but. Uh, I was just uh, not bad. Oh, well, it's a compliment. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I had to put a little bit of back work in there. Leg work and back work for myself this afternoon. Roger, that'll be nice. A nice old Shadulu or tortoise pan, one of those leopards here on the western side. Well, they said, remember we had tortoise pan? Well, that's what the guy said. I didn't see any tracks, but uh, one of the other gentlemen from another lodge said they had a male leopard tracks coming directly into this area where we're in, going into now. Uh, so I'm just going past here, but I haven't seen a single thing. I've got a feeling if it was tortoise pan, it might have just crossed straight back west into, uh, into Arethusa. That's just to the west of us here. That's another property that, of course, we did not uh, traverse on. So we can't really follow up there. Uh, 
Oh, look at old man, that's old Steve and Eric. And old Morgan as well. One of them going on leave tomorrow. Same as uh, j -Mos. he's also heading out tomorrow. And Marcel, and Max is back tomorrow morning. So, hmm. a nice little bit of a, tur how can I say, a turnover of uh, staff for tomorrow. That's gonna be interesting, gonna be nice. What did you say? What did, what did Jared say? I, I don't hear anything. From who? Hammy. Hammy. Uh, yeah, how did I react with our oh, well, chillest cubs? Sorry, I just want to put my radio up here because I think sometimes you get into this area and the radio doesn't work too well. Yeah. So I'm just going to put the radio here. Yeah. There you go. Stay there. And stay. Um, yeah, look, Chillis Cubs is another story. Um, I'm very hard sore about that. I mean, that is something I really was hoping that those Cubs, those three Cubs are going to pull through and we're going to see them, you know, growing into adults and be part of the Nkuma pride and all that. And, uh, but yeah, uh, once again, all the male, like, male line activity around, it's, it's very tough. As well, the area that Chilla had of Cubs, they had twin dams. It's, it's, uh, that area, I don't know. It's just to me, it's next to a water hole. You're going to get lions coming down to that water hole. You're going to get coalitions coming through. So I don't think it was uh, the, the smartest little spot that she chose. Um, yeah, no, very sad. But that's, you know, that's nature. Nature is like that. So we con continue and, um, you know, I'm hoping that they get successful and start mating with the Kumbula males. I know that a lot of say like, ah, oh, but Kumbulas is, uh, I think, cousins or something like that from the Birminghams. Uh, so, uh, I'm not too sure the lineage of those Kumbulas. I know, look, they're coming from the south. And maybe, the, maybe it's a Birmingham's daughters or someone that's actually... Uh, with the mothers of the Kambulas. That could be possible. I'm not too sure. But uh, yeah, it's typical with that kind of stuff. So, Jared, are you still there? So I just want to double check if my radio is working. I did put my radio up here now. Ah. So yeah, no, that is, uh, so, oh well, you know, I can't wait to see Chela again. Uh, it was a beautiful highlight clip today on Safari with the highlight clips with uh, old Chela taking and stealing the buffalo skin from uh, one of the hyenas. I'm not too sure which one it was. I think it was in Gangarika. And, uh, or no, sorry, it was uh, June. And stealing the skin from June. And uh, just, uh, the hyenas are just watching our and Chilla steals it and went to go and nibble on that. Nice sighting. So I don't know where she's moved on to. I don't know if she's now the rest of the Nkuhuma pride and she's also gone uh, to the west, to Arethusa. Very possible. Very possible, but we'll see. I've got a feeling there's other lions on the property. I, I just got a feeling there's, uh, there's more lions on the property. Maybe Maybe even the Telemati pride. Because to me, it just, you know, there was lion tracks coming all the way down Vuyatilla Axis. And Kuhumas were there last night at Biffleshook Dam. That's that side. And they would have come past here, come through here. But there's tracks going down Vuyatilla Axis for a few lions, two or three of them. Um, so, yeah. But we'll have to see. Maybe we pick up on the tracks tomorrow morning. Anyway, while well, we're going to continue towards uh, Zoe's, uh, let's go and uh, see what uh, Stevie's up to. Thanks, Cedric. And we're just having a listen, everybody. We came across some vultures in the trees. There's a few of them around and we heard some very strange noises a moment ago, so just lend us your ears.
Did you hear that panda? Is it coming from this side, eh? Let's have a little look. Just poke our nose in there. It's something making a strange noise. It's a very nice game path over here. A number of vultures around. This is the area that they had uh, a lot of lion activity this morning moving through. Ah, a number of vultures in the tree on my left hand side. You don't want to put the light on them or It's tricky at night to follow up on this sort of thing. Cedric, you will have plenty of time with Chella. She's been quite, quite active lately. <laughs> James Richard, one wild dog sighting in Sentinel will never be the same. You are so right. And, uh, well, it's not happening this evening with wild dogs. It's not going to be me. Who does it? Not sure who it's going to happen to. Okay, well, I don't see anything here. I'll let Cedric know and uh, he can come and follow up in this area in the morning. The vultures definitely weren't on this road this morning. I came through here. a whole lot of them. We're just here at Mumba Mumba Loop Junction just off on the northern side so a nice area to check. Maybe we'll get something on the road on our way down. Zandi, it didn't take very long, but I got thrown in a bit of the deep end with regards to being out in the dark. But it does take a bit of practice. Uh, um, I did a fair bit of, of daytime stuff when I was a student. And then I started doing some work for, for Singita. And they wanted me to do leopard habituation in the Lobombo property. So what that meant was three maybe four nights a week i would go out just as the game drives were finishing so like now 6 37 catch up with the game drives if anybody had a leopard or had seen a leopard i would basically go and spend the next 12 hours out in the bush trying to find them spend time with them track them down you name it spend time with leopards and um yeah i would be out all night by myself in a vehicle that was fun that was fun. Oh, that's a hyena. That's a couple of hyenas. Are they following the vultures too? Don't take me in there. I want to be close to the road. So I was thrown in the deep end. I would spend three, four nights a week from seven till seven, just basically out. And sometimes I found a lion pride. Oh, it was a vulture that took off. Sometimes I'd find a lion pride and I'd follow them the whole, whole night long. Just have a little listen. Have a little listen. 
let's quickly go to Eric. So we've just had a caracal. I was at a water hole and he's not just dashed off, but he's somewhere around here. I'm not exactly too sure. Very small. It was very quick. Very, very quick. But there's a little pan. Not a, it's not even a little pan. It's a little puddle here. And uh, he was lying, not lying, he was sitting right next to it, he or she. Where did you go? Sure, I haven't seen a caracal in quite some time. I think the last time I saw a caracal was that one very close to <clears throat> the western fence line actually. I wonder if you gonna come back out. Cedric's probably going to fall that one. Very, very possible that these monkeys had seen this caracal earlier today. Because the lion tracks that I found were not nowhere near this area, but they were quite a, a way down in a place where I don't think the monkeys would have been able to see them. And now... We've had this caracal down here by the water. It's possible it could have been sitting underneath a bush. Very, very possible. And, uh, yeah, I didn't hear, I mean, when the monkeys were calling, it didn't sound like a lion call. A lion call has a little bit of a high-pitched click in it. 
And that's not something that I heard. This was, it sounded just like a, be, yeah, like I said, be careful kind of. There's something, something's not right in the area. And uh, yeah, I suspect this caracal's probably been hanging around this area for quite some time. I mean, we've driven up this road. No, we didn't. We didn't drive up this road actually. Oh, well, we tried, but then we, we are going to send you back up to Cedric. Thank you, Eric. So he just put some lights off there now because we were just passing uh, a few male impalas and I never want to blind them. Well, there's, uh, there's another impala in the bush. I just saw eyes. Lots of eyes. Really want to get to see a little Janet here. Oh, I was last year, if I'm not mistaken. We got to see that uh, that Janet with uh, the little ones, and we saw that here on uh, one of the roads that's just to the east of us. It was like it was like a female with uh, two youngsters. Well, that's a good thing about the spotlight. At least you can, if they're looking at you and their eyes are reflecting, then you can quickly try and take a look exactly, you know, what you're looking at and, uh, and spot them that way. All righty then, let's see. Uh... I thought as well, someone's saying that looks like maybe, maybe, the speculation that ribbon a female hyena might look pregnant that'll be interesting and she was seen with uh, june and koa and gangarika uh, this morning last night or, or this morning early this morning on dam cam and somebody says it looks like it looks like ribbon might be pregnant very difficult to say or tell but you know if that's the case, that'll be fantastic. I think very soon we have to start looking at these uh, hyena dens again, especially here on Taxons Road. Start looking at these ones this side, see if any of the hyenas have returned for those, uh, you know, for cubs here. Or maybe, I don't know where June's youngster is, or Fluffy. But, uh, but June has done so well with her youngster. I'm sure Fluffy must be still there somewhere in the south. Really, a lot of cubs. Yeah, there's something in the air, and I'm sure. I'm hoping sooner or later we are going to get lucky with something that's going to be more kind of, how can I say, stable with us seeing, you know, the cubs, or even if it's, you know, pups from wild dogs, you know, us to see that again. So let's see. I mean, Columba, you know, might take us maybe sooner or later to a den or introduce us to her cubs, or cub. I don't know. I don't know if she's got where she's had them, nothing like it. I haven't seen her yet, so I just, uh, of course, James and Steve uh, just giving me a little bit of insight on their sightings over the last two weeks. So, yeah, interesting times there. Come on, Chameleon, where's Fred? Fred must be here somewhere. Where do we usually see Fred? I think I've seen Fred once or twice up here. Fred the chameleon. <laughs> oh, Chris used to call the chameleons Fred. Oh, I laughed that day. Well, that was when he was, when he was, when he was here, still at Juma. And the one day he found a chameleon. He's like, ah, oh, there's old Fred. <laughs> Fancy playing Safari Snaps? Or showing off your photo skills in fun competitions? How about sneak peeks of our brand new camera spots 
and live chats with fellow AfriCam fans. Well, AfriCam All Access has got your back. Just head to AfriCam's YouTube channel, hit the join button and select AfriCam All Access. You'll unlock AfriCam premium website perks and all the VIP benefits of our YouTube memberships. Bumbling, maybe seeing if we can see anything. It was very nice. The maintenance team of Amakala has nicely redone this road. They took a big plow to it with a big teeth, deep thing, things, claw like looking things, and uh, they plowed the whole road. Now, obviously, this road because it's a downhill and it's going that way the the water would have eroded it quite badly Kelly we will try our very best to enjoy ourselves on our leave try and be as safe as possible we would like to be able to come back but uh, yeah we're rather looking forward to it but yeah, I'm looking forward to coming back and seeing what has happened with the, the animals, the flowers, the birds. I'm hoping there's going to be a, a lot more wildflowers out and about when we do come back. Lots of colours, purple, yellow, pink, white. Enjoy your time off, Morgan and Eric. The dreadlock twins, as James likes to call them. Or should, I, should I say Jimps? Jimps is also on leave. Well, I don't know if James actually ever takes leave or is on leave. He's always busy with, with something. But I'm going on leave tomorrow. I'm going on leave in, in five minutes, actually. Well, in five minutes, we'll get back to camp. I'll give the car another little spritzing over because, well, I already gave it a clean today, but it's going to need another little spritz. And then a handover with Amy and some dinner. So Shiv would like a final oh my word moment. Should I just drop the spotlight and run into the bush, Shiv, and scream, oh my word, because something might happen. Um, so three hyenas went into that area where the vultures were. We didn't really see anything, so I can't comment. But uh, I was reluctant to 
to try and push Sentinel in the dark into a thicket. So I did go in and then we came out. We went in when you saw us. We went in again after the hyenas. And we quick linked you to Eric and his, his Karakal or Roikat. Karakal, Roikat. Shiv, one more oh my word moment. <laughs> Just waving to, I think that's Clayton from Chitra as he drives through. One more last opportunity for me on this stint to find Klalamba, other, otherwise known to Nadine, the director, as Kali, because she can't say that Kla. Really quite funny. So we call Nadine now Kali. Well, and Paul does anyway, and I've started calling her that. Jared, do you call her Kali yet? Jared's the other director at the moment. He's in my ear. Don't think he does. Yeah, Jared. <laughs> Jared didn't even know about it, but Kali is on the D2 there, it seems. <laughs> the couple of Impala. Good night, ladies. We wish you happy rutting. We'll be catching up with you as soon as the rutting really kicks off in a couple of weeks. I'll be anyway. Cedric will be with you the entire time. Oh, Rosemary, it's been my absolute pleasure. This afternoon's sunset moment was actually quite special. It was really quite special. And it's been a wonderful stint. I've thoroughly enjoyed being out and about. It's been nice to also steer the Safari Sentinel around. I'm interested to see how everything unfolds with my ribs, with Lalamba and her possible babies, which uh, we're almost certain she has. We just have no idea where. But uh, Cedric will be put to task while I'm away. So I wish all of you well. Happy viewing. I'm going to go enjoy some quiet time down in the garden route. Hopefully there's still some sunshine for the waves. Gonna enjoy some time on the beach and in the forest and catching up with, with friends. Thank you for joining us on this afternoon's sunset safari. It's been quite nice to have some lions in Amakala. No lions with us, but uh, we'll make sure that that happens tomorrow morning. Everybody don't forget we'll be live with you in the morning, same time from the two locations. Thanks for your questions and comments. See you all soon. Have a magical evening from me. It's goodbye for now.